Good morning and thank you very much for joining us. I am Yori Folani. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, apologize for, you know, coming uh, a bit behind schedule. Uh, here we are, so there's no more time to spend. Our guest this morning is Mr. Marui, Mr. Morui Ed, uh, Um I hope I didn't make too much of a mess of that. Uh, okay, I can see you. I did. You're smiling. Uh, uh, good morning to you. And thank you very much for being with Good us. Morning, thank you very much. Good morning. Ed, Ed, Say it for me, please. Ed, Ed, I, I tried. Yes, Ed, 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 if you had just, if you had cut it more, I would probably would be frowning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Omarui. Uh, Mr. Edogawere is a, a startup business lawyer and a financial analyst. Okay, now legal luminary chief Ate Babalala S A N has been proposing the idea of um, you know uh, that the president that the country and the president should actually be looking into uh, what debt uh, debt forgiveness, uh, lowering the interest rates and the actual principal itself. Um, what are the options here uh, to hear from you as a specialist? Well, that may be just one way of coming out of this quagmire. Because if you look at the data, uh, external debt stock is um, over the roof, right? Um, if you add cumulatively um, the last request for about a $1.5 billion loan, it will be taking our debt stock to over 107 uh, trillion naira in debt. If you look at the budgets, for instance, 29% um, of, um, of revenue is supposed to be used to service debt. Why key, um, key developmental sectors of the country and the economy, healthcare, education, um, housing, are getting between 5 and 8% um, allocation. So that tells you that our debt burden is crushing and, you know, Painfully, our external debt grew by um, over over three hundred percent just within 2022 and 2023. You, we moved from three billion to 38 billion dollars in in debt. And so, one way of going about it is to deploy your passenger example, um, yes. speak to um, our creditors, and look. These debts are becoming um, are becoming a Herculean burden. And, you know, there's, there's a way debt becomes so much that it becomes unpayable. And parties now have to sit down and renegotiate and look at, look at how to come out of that quagmire. We are in a quagmire. Our economy has very, very unique um, challenges that are bedeviling uh, key sectors of our economic growth. So we, we've got to look at data and you'll find that our external debts are high. And one way of assuaging that is to possibly explore um, an interest freeze, because our interest today is about 152% interest. And that's also because over time we have failed to service those um, uh, uh, debts appropriately. And so agreements are agreements, right? A, a popular meme would say agreement is agreement, right? So what the parties have agreed um, will continue to inure until the parties sit back again and say, look, this is no longer feasible. Um, I know that the IMF have released a report to say, look, our dependence on oil has done us a lot of um, damage economically because oil, remain, oil revenue remains the mainstay of our economy. However, it's a major step back because it's keeping um, our population growth dynamics within a particular um, demographic, yes. and it's affecting the growth of other countries, right? So remember, I think I was with you when I said, look, I really want to see non-oil exports give oil a run for their money. It's becoming clearer by the day that we've got to look beyond oil. We've got to uh, empower other sectors of the economy um, to be able to create that, that need balance that we need, you know? But if you are asking for debt services, right, it's one thing to ask for debt services. It's another thing to justify, right, the need 
to get this, um, this service, these um, incentives or these waivers, and also show how these waivers will improve and prevent you from coming back to borrow again. Indeed. Because it makes no economic sense. Indeed. And uh, one of the yes. points that uh, Chief uh, Babalala is a, and, uh, highlighted was the uh, previously unknown, at least in this form, Japa syndrome. And um, arguably, the um, health sector has been uh, quite viciously hit with medical doctors trooping out. And he had opined that one of the, well, the, about the only way to stop this was to uh, actually increase the pay for medical uh, personnel. We have so many talented specialists that are out in the diaspora, other areas of the world, um, uh, primarily because the services are rated, uh, they're rated higher. When I say rated higher, they're getting a humongous salary uh, compared to what is up obtainable here. Now, the question I wanted to ask is that, yeah, be that as it may, and uh, he suggested that that's about the only way he sees to stem this flow. You were talking about debt servicing earlier. Uh, maybe the ordinary man's question would be, well, you people have managed it. You said, among other things, that we have failed in certain aspects that has brought this situation to where it's at. Uh, what, what is the, wh why, why is there or is there an obligation for our creditors to indeed listen to us and say, uh, look, when we started off, this was the agreement and understanding, uh, but now we'd like you to you know, begin to give us some, quote-unquote, uh, free passes. Uh, what's, it, what's in it for them, and um, why... Uh, would we uh, necessarily be hopeful when we make these requests? So, um, one thing that is often said is that if you continue to do something the same way and expect a different result, you may just most likely be insane. And if we really look at our numbers, our current reality, uh, we will find that one of the biggest challenges that have brought us here have been a large dependence on importation. And with importation comes a, a, a reliance on foreign exchange, and that has been one of the biggest challenges that we've had. Um, if you also re recall the central bank governor's um, presentation <clears throat> before the National Assembly um, last week, he gave a bit of data that showed a humongous, for want of better language, a humongous um, influx, uh, a humong humongous exportation of foreign exchange, right? Over 90 billion spent in education, healthcare, um, tourism, and the likes, right? Now, this tells you that we've got a, an indigenous problem. We're not producing as we should. We're not producing sustainably. Right, and if, even if you also even look at the IMF report, it also says that there is um, you have over 25 million uh, Nigerians suffering food insecurity, and this is about 13 percent of our population. And the challenge we have with food insecurity, uh, food insecurity, is general insecurity, especially in the hot beds where food um, in the large large hubs for food production the north and some other parts of the country. So we've got these challenges that we ha now have to look at, right, to address some of the things that have brought us here. Agri is fundamental. Improving indigenous manufacturing and exportation so as to attract the uh, inflow of foreign exchange is very important. Reliance on FX, Right, because part of the problem why it appears like our debt profile is just going over the pool is also the volatility of the, the naira um, against the dollar. Right, and the only way you can stabilize the naira is to give it some measure of strength and bargaining power. The only way you can do that really is if you improve indigenous production, if you if you push more for exportation as against importation. So these are some of the things that we've got to look at. And these are some of the prevailing arguments that government has got to make before its creditors. To say, look, we've got to, we want to look inward. We want to focus on developing, you know, certain key indices for growth and development in this country in order to, to take us away from the debt um, reliance uh, angle and to give us some measure of sustainability. And we believe that giving us 
this interest freeze or even cancellation in some instances, and even reduction of debt would help. And that was one of the things the passenger did at the time because he looked at it to say, look, this money is not payable. We just don't have it. And so he went on, uh, on a trip around the world, you know, and having unique conversations with each creditor to say, look, open the books again, let's look. But I assure you that if you give us this incentive, you will find this in our economy. Mm. And so this is a unique conversation that we're about to have. I'm, I'm excited to also know, right, and, I, and I'm inclined with his argument, the Minister of Finance is not a fan of borrowing, and he has continued to say that, look, if we want to get out of this quagmire, we've got to look at a reduced um, penchant for borrowing. Mm. And, um, so Nigeria so continues to be the largest black market in the world. So we will always be a creditor's delight, and they will always throw money to you and keep you perpetually in debt. But until you now look at your current realities, right? And how this is affecting your uh, de developmental project, how this is affecting even how much you are able to release on capital expenditure, on improving the economy and infrastructure growth in the nation, until you are able to now focus more on that, then you really will not be able to impactfully grow. We can be servicing debt at 29%, and financing healthcare at five or six percent, and then you talk about Japa. People yes. will Japa. Yes, yes. So, our uh, 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 human resource personnel require <laughs> that buffer, right? I see the NLC for minimum wage and all that. And why those things are fantastic, right? If we don't fix our inflation problem, if we do not tackle this FX. Um, uh, reliance, right, that makes our Naira so volatile, we will continue to push for minimum wage increase. Because no matter how you increase it, the cost of goods will continue to go up. And you, well, what's inflation? A lot of money chasing little product. Uh, right? Uh, so um, the, the dynamics have to be looked at. And we've got to now have some measure of out-of-the-box uh, fiscal engineering. They're looking at our current realities and what works best for us. You know, you said, among other things, that um, it, it, we're largely an import-based economy. Uh, Nigerians have developed a taste for imports. In fact, uh, some of the activities that you see, either in the regular press or indeed on social media, you'd never know it to see some of the things that our people uh, get up to. I'm, I imagine uh, people will be wondering, uh, of course, it's a distorted view, but then you do see uh, the profligacy that um, some of our people are demonstrating. Our tastes are very, very high on important goods. Uh, you've spoken about our manufacturing is just down there in the doldrums. Um, since we've developed this taste, um, can it be? Can there be an intervention? I think it was the last president who lamented that. Even toothpicks, uh, uh, toothpicks are a drain uh, on our foreign reserve. Uh, so, so, so bad has the situation become. Uh, is, it, is, it, is it a feasible option to just cut all non-essential um, imports, by which we mean luxury foods and, 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 and that kind of a thing, luxury foods, luxury goods, uh, and, and all of that? reserving the scarce, very, very minimal uh, foreign exchange that we do have for really properly defined you know, uh, necessities. It is How doable is that? Could that lead to social unrest? So here's one thing that I, I do, and as a person I do. You do not stop something until you can provide a viable alternative. Right, and I think that it will be a bit draconian to cut off without really looking at the alternatives. What are the alternatives we have on the ground? Right, so before we start, you know, tightening our importation belts, how are we loosening the uh, manufacturing belt locally? Right, what are we doing to empower local manufacturing, local production? And so that even when you shut the door on exports, on certain goods, people have local alternatives to now 
go to and, uh, and purchase. If you don't do that, you will just be lead, uh, creating a situation where there will be scarcity and where people will become engineers and people will start smuggling. So that will not be an alternative, right? So let's look at focusing heavily on improving the indices of in, uh, um, local manufacturing, power, security, tax, tax rebates, and some pioneer, pioneer incentive statuses, um, certain political will and government support pushed more towards indigenous manufacturers. So here's the thing. You have people who are willing to produce locally, right? But they are competing with people who are important, right? And they're not able to balance the costs. And that's a challenge. Because the problem you now find is that I who have produced locally have pegged my products at a particular price. The fellow who is important has pegged his at a particular price, and his is more affordable because he's not battling with some of the challenges that I am battling with producing locally. So government has got to look at those things. What are those things, and how do we fix them? Right? Power is a very fundamental issue, and I always say, look, you can incentivize certain things like power. So how about us creating hotbeds in the country for power? To say, look, you know what? If you want to go into manufacturing, come to, I'm going to use my village, right? I'm going to use my, 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 my state, Benin. Come to Benin for manufacturing. There'll be 20 hours uninterrupted, 24 hours uninterrupted power, power supply. And that becomes a hotbed for manufacturing. And you do that across two, three, four, five, six locations in the country, boosting. Now, if you cut out the challenge of power, you have taken out a large chunk of every, every manufacturer's body. I run a business and I can tell you how much I spend on power. And you will still find that alternative sources of power do not measure up in any way to the value of the main source of power if it is steady. So government must now begin to look at some of these things, right? It's good to give power to everybody in the country and stabilize power supply. Great. But we're not there yet. Yeah. So let's focus on creating power manufacturing. Mm. Create our beds, so to speak. And so that's so because, for instance, in every part of the world, if you look at places, for instance, like China, the bulk of their productions are based on the resources of the locations. So you want to buy cotton, they'll tell you a particular location because they have large array of uh, uh, natural resources that fuel the cotton development. And so we've got, we've got to start looking at that now when it comes to food. I have always said the problem we have with food supply, aside from insecurity, is our logistic supply chain. And if we don't fix the supply chain, we're just going to be making a mess of anything we're doing. Why don't we have train routes from the food hotspots down to uh, the end users or the, the major uh, uh, cities where you have the consumers? If we don't start doing uh, looking in, uh, ingeniously to some of these challenges, what we'll find is that we'll continue to cherry pick solutions that will not work for us. Security well, is another key challenge. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, Security, uh, uh, so, you know, uh, is integral uh, to economic growth. I beg your pardon. I was going to um, sort of uh, interject there about um, uh, clearly what you're seeing, and I think. What the government also knows uh, is that we, we have to look at our economy differently uh, from how it has been in the past because now we're in uh, something of a, uh, to put it quite delicately, a very, very challenging uh, situation. Um, as I said, the government also knows this. Um, President Tinubu's, uh, you know, ruling party, he arrived on the mantra of renewed hope different thinking. Um, give me your candid assessment, just uh, observing as a knowledgeable Nigerian, uh, how optimistic you are that indeed we are proceeding uh, along the right path in terms of looking at things differently. Because we've been hearing that um, it, it, it appears tough now, uh, but we definitely are doing the right things and that whereas it is tough, this is part of the cost that we are paying, it is going to be better. Uh, how much of that do you buy? So let me tell you, 
let me let me let me respond to this by sharing a, a, a story right a woman in labor feels labor pain and so that pain is intense right and the medical personnel always say don't worry just push you'll be fine right um just keep it until you're 10 centimeters dilated and then you you can start pushing and so you know they have they they, they, they manage the pain however there is also something called epidural or certain form of painkillers that are given in order to assuage that pain, especially when it gets intense. So really, um, we know that there, there is light at the end of the tunnel. But, you know, let me, let me, go, let me go into vernacular. A person where don't survive, now you go see the light at the end of the tunnel. So government has got to now look at essential palliatives that will help abridge that pain. Are we in a precarious economic situation? Yes. Was it brought about by the present administration? I do not think so. But is there a need to assuage and balance that pain? Definitely. And I'll tell you why, right? If you keep people just with that word of hold on, it will be fine at the end of the day, and things keep looking bleaker, so to speak, and it appears like um, there are certain um, challenges that they are facing, they won't buy whatever you're selling anymore. And so government has got to look at unique challenges. And let's look at it. I'm, at, I'm happy to see that they are opening up um, grains and releasing grains. But how about a food standardization arrangement? How about subsidizing the indices that have, are, is making food, um, staple foods go up? Right, so we saw some videos, and I'm sure you saw some videos. Market women complaining in, in Congo, or uh, I don't know what they call it, or a paint or a bucket of gari has gone up from a particular amount to another amount. How about us ensuring that we keep this thing within a particular limit? How about us looking clearly to those who are sabotaging the system? Because one big challenge that the Nigerian consuming market has is the uh, uh, opportunistic behavior of certain business business personnel who capitalize on every, every slight opportunity to maximize profit to the detriment of the people. And so how about looking intentionally to plug the holes that these people are relying on to be opportunistic? What are the things that Nigerians are crying about? Not too much. Staple food, transportation, and for business persons, tax Indeed. revenue generation. Tax mm. are in, we are in an emergency situation. I'd expect government to say to um, our tax authorities, you know what? Give tax holidays for a particular amount of time, right? For certain businesses that meet a particular threshold. Talk to um, the market, ma ma market associations. Work out a price standardization arrangement by intentionally understanding the indices that are making these prices go up. You know, you can, if you really want to be certain, Go to the location where these staple foods are being, are, being, are being cultivated and harvested and all that. You will find that there is really no drastic increase in, the, in, in, that, in their costs. Yes, they are they're also filling the problem, but the increase is not drastic. All right. You know, I tell you what, Ma Omaru, I, be, I beg your pardon for interrupting you. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Omaru. I'll, I'll be, we'll, we'll, we'll take a short break now. We'll be right back and uh, we'll continue this conversation and also take uh, perspectives from uh, viewers uh, watching us. Stay with us, please. Lagos is the most visited state in Africa as the fifth largest economy on the continent. Covering the state and its government, it's no me feet, it's a busy beat. We go beyond the curtain of tapes to travel in far into the deep. I want to thank the Lagos state government for the healthcare facility. To bring stories that cut across all spectrums. The greater Lagos shall be ours. We tell you stories that define our collective well-being as Lagosians. 
I'm Adido Jassalam Adini. I live in Lagos, inside Lagos. Welcome back. Uh, Omarui Ediogia is uh, with us. He's a, a lawyer and a financial analyst. Uh, thank you indeed for staying with us. Um, we're, we're looking at, you know, the background to the situation in which uh, Afeba Balala S.A.N. Uh, has counseled the president to ask for debt relief, maybe even outright forgiveness. Such is the uh, uh, dire straits in which we are in. In fact, so much so that um, no less a person uh, than uh, Pastor Adeboe of Nigeria has said that our, our woes are not just socioeconomic. A spiritual dimension is required. Uh, good morning to you, Reverend Dominic. Thank you for holding on. Good morning, Chief Yori. Good morning to our guest. Yes. Over there, I have spoken well. Yes. Yori, I give your indulgence if you give me 60 seconds. You sure. Will make my point. Sure. Yori, let me say this. You are expert there. The people in government in Nigeria, which we voted to, should not look at us here as illiterate. We are not. Is that we dedicated authority to them? I had the, the minister of the coordinating minister that is making a statement to the National Assembly that if they go to the IMF, they hate them. If they go to the Central Committee, they hate them. They hate them. They remove subsidy. What I'm trying to say, are they helping them because Nigeria is hungry? Are they helping them because we cannot afford water? Yori, I'm a pastor. Yet on Saturday, I bought diesel, 1,350 naira per liter. Who is an industrial man or a pure water producer that can produce anything with 1,350? Yori, that is by the way. Yori, in South Africa, if a girl is put to bed, it has what culture is support. In America, there's subsidy in agriculture. In London, UK, there's subsidy in power, so people don't die out of cold. What is what we have in Nigeria as a social balancing that can make these things work? What we have, nothing. How could you say that international community is helping you by policy of removing every subsidy and everybody is on its own? We can't buy water. We can't buy rice. We can't buy peace. What kind of a nation is that? Somebody is, you know, is sabotaging this government. Mr. President must listen to Nigeria. They don't back for subsidy. Price will crash. Give that subsidy to them today. Give it to protect on the binary. Now we're using 40 million a day. If someone giving it to somebody who said that his sheep are in the high sea, then what is producing. But that is producing. Put back the subsidy to them. At least for 200 naira. Everything will crash overnight. There's no need of debt forgiveness. If you forgive debt from Nigeria, why should you forgive debt from Nigeria? The debt you took, what do you use it to do? No reasonable person will forgive your debt when you use it expressly. Briore, your expert go and say, every nation will have subsidy. Why should the third world in quote, Nigeria has no subsidy? That's the problem. People are revolting. I grab a pastor, I'm a local pastor. I, people are going through hunger, starvation. In a church, somebody collapsed because of hunger. Something was done. Something must be returned and make it genuinely. God, good morning, Nigeria. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Dominic, for calling in. Uh, Omaru, uh, wh what would be your reaction to uh, Reverend Dominic's uh, uh, submission, uh, especially when you put it all behind the background of uh, our being told that we can't afford subsidies uh, anymore? So I, know I had said it uh, at the onset, and I think I've said it before, that full subsidy should have gone uh, because certain people were ripping the country off and the uh, general commonwealth was going into the pockets of others. However, government also needs to subsidize anything. So the issue is not about subsidy. The issue is about what is being subsidized, okay. right? Okay. And who the end value. And I think that, and that's why I said, look, Staple foods have got to be subsidized. Transportation, 
the, the dynamics around transportation, you will find that if really an audit goes into transportation cost, you find that at least 40 to, to 50 percent of that money goes into private pockets. We've got to start plugging those holes <laughs> because it's, it, it, that is what is killing the end consumer. And that's the major challenge. Because they'll tell you, for instance, that a tuba of yam is XYZ expensive because of how much it costs to bring yam from XYZ place down to Lagos, for instance. So how about fixing the challenges and cutting that cost? And the, what will now be the justification for that person to, 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 to uh, uh, um, charge XYZ amount for a tuba of yam? If we don't look intentionally at these things, you will continue to find revenue going into private pockets at the expense of the average Nigerian. And that's what the main oil subsidy was doing to us, right? People were ripping us off from over how many million liters consum consumption a day after subsidy was reduced. We now realize that less than, less than 15 million liters were being consumed. So what happened to that excess number, right? Mm -hmm. One moment, please. Let, <clears throat> let me, I beg your pardon. Let me bring George in on the conversation. Good morning, Mr. George in, in Ikeja. Good morning, Uncle Yari. Thank Good morning to your guest as well. Yes. Uh, Uncle Yari, I'm going to take this subject from the perspective of uh, the ordinary man in the street. You came to me to borrow money to do something, supposedly. Now, that thing that you took the money to do, you did not do it well. You are not getting results from it. You didn't handle it well, and you are coming back to me to forgive you, to, uh, to wipe away the debt for you. How do I know what to do with my money? Look at one or two. I don't know how many seconds you can give me. I'll just paint one or two scenarios for you. Nigeria borrowed a lot of money for power. Where is the power today? And we are still crying that we want to borrow more. We don't block leakages. You run a budget of 20, 26 trillion in a year. And you borrow money to fund the budget. Borrowing is supposed to be tied to projects. Where are the projects that you executed in a budget? At the end of the year, we hear that only about 30% of the budget was executed. Yet the money that was borrowed to run it, we don't know where the money goes. It goes into private pockets. Block leakages. Go to Borno State on Kiori. Uh, it was only recently I took a closer look at the budget of uh, Borno State. They have hardly had a budget higher, annual budget higher than 300 billion. And is it this 300 billion that this governor has been using to build and rebuild and support security for a, 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 a war torn state? You go to Borno, you won't believe the structures in uh, Borno. Far, far better than many other states. Go to Ebony. When the woman, the woman was there, he was running a budget of about 200, 220 billion in a year. But we all know how he turned Ebony into like uh, the, 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 the Dubai of the South East. What I'm, the point I'm making is when you borrow money, what you do with the money is what counts. Look at our oil, oil, oil revenue. The amount of crude that is stolen in a day is about 50% of the total output. We have not checked that one. This, is, this idea of uh, uh, debt relief uh, is neither here nor there. I don't think it's so. Instead of going to be begging, please forgive our debt, we should look at what has happened to the money we borrowed before. How can we get the money we we borrow, use it for what supposed to be used for, and make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the, your speaker said $170 billion. $170 billion has been borrowed over time. Can we show any project that that one uh, you know, uh, did for the country? We are, still, we, are, we are still in hunger. We are still in uh, no, no light. Yes. No, the, the, the Nigerians are not lazy people. Give them power today. You will see how this economy will just turn around almost magically. We don't have the power, and we have spent the money. Yes. All right. It's worrisome. Let's, let the president pay more attention to people stealing public money 
and block leakages. We will not go to anybody to say, please, uh, you know, help me to uh, forgive my, my, my debt. That's why I agree with, uh, with, with what Reverend said. He said we should bring back something. It's like bringing back corruption. We are trying to say, call the corruption out of it. We can make, we can still do well with removal of poor subsidy if corruption is addressed. All right, then. Thank you very much uh, for calling in, Mr. George. Well, you know, Amarui, people are actually indeed uh, frustrated. Um, they, they have a situation where we, we have a situation where most people don't feel that uh, corruption is being uh, tackled um, uh, vigorously enough. And um, there are those who are saying that perhaps it's a, it's a sort of a, a survival, self-survival uh, uh, mechanism. I'm thinking here of, you've heard the two speakers who have already uh, joined the program uh, saying that abysmal performance when it comes to the use of scarce resources is at the root of our problem. Um, the kind of people that we find in high office that will look at a budget and perhaps, at least theoretically, uh, begin to think of, aha, now what's in this for me? How much can be creamed off? We don't have, perhaps you'll agree, the kind of society that uh, Lee, Lee, uh, Lee Kuan Yew society in, in Singapore, where there's a totally radically different approach to um, public uh, to, to governance. Here, uh, we depend on, put your hand on the Bible, the Quran, or whatever other book, and swear to, to be an honest person. And very little is done by way of checks and balances, and certainly not very much at all is being done in, in terms of, um, you know, a, a accounting for your actions. Where, where is the road out of this, seeing as we are who we are, unfortunately? Well, the starting point is to have an impact assessment. Um, they often say that, and a Nigerian adage says, if you don't know where rain started beating you, you will know where it stops. So we've got to look really at what has brought us this far. Why, uh, why are we in the mess that we're in? And let's look at let's look at an impact assessment of the loans that we have collected. And I believe that that's one of the most important things that this government should do and audit, right? So it's not just CPN that needs this body. Our debt office, we need to look at our data and how much we got it. How much went to the project? How much was lost in the pool of leakages? How much now? Some uh, assuming of we have also, such data. Assuming we have such data, right? But you will even be surprised that some of these debts that were already servicing interest have not been fully called up or fully uh, taken because Nigeria still has a few um, uh, prerequisites to meet, right? So. This also tells you that there's need for a thorough evaluation of our debt profile. So we even know, you know, sometimes you just keep, um, you just keep borrowing because you have a brand, you have a market, mm. right? And I borrow your creditors delight. So you feel that it's a credit line you have, you stretch your hand and, the, and, the, and it comes. And, you can, and because you're not even checking to know if you really need to borrow. If you, or if you need to plug the holes and reject, if you need to look at these debts again with asking intentional questions to ask, really, where are we on some of these things? Some of these debts have not been called on. Okay, let me bring, I beg your pardon, let me bring in uh, Mohammed. Mr. Mohammed has called in from Abuja. Good morning to you, sir. I think we just lost Mohammed. Uh, uh, please continue. Uh, the, 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 uh, the attitude uh, of... Uh, of, of those in, in governance. Uh, we, we've seen some, you know, bright sparks in this particular administration, perhaps. Uh, let me tell you, let me put you short. Let me put you short, right? But let me tell you, I'll give you an example with the Minister of Works. Yes, I was that was one of the bright sparks you I was going to mention. You saw, you saw an interview of his inspection of one of the, one of the section of the East-West Road. That's right. And how Nigerian Nigerian officials were undermining a government project by not ensuring that the contractor follows due diligence, even after the minister had written 
officially to communicate certain things to them. And so you ask yourself, really, who is who's really at fault? It's a hydra headed it's a hydra headed problem. It, it and is. It all, and it takes all back to nobody. Nobody is immune from look the, 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 this pressure, right? Unfortunately, we at the other end of the of the of, of the stick, right, as bearing the brunt because we do not have the buffer of the paraphernalia office to 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 survive, so to speak, or to to stay um, going, right? While the other people have that. But if you really look at it, everyone is, has a, has a blame in this in this in this mess. Indeed. Let me bring in Femi in Alagbado. Sorry to interrupt you. I beg your pardon. Uh, Femi in Alagbado, please carry on. Femi in Alagbado, can you hear us? There seems to be. Hello. Good morning, Femi in Alagbado. Carry on, please. Good morning. Are you hearing me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go on. Okay, then. Good morning. Good morning. I, the, well, I'm over 70 now. And uh, when we were going to school in the early days, they told us that uh, we are doing some systems farming instead of mechanical farming. And um, my children have been, taught, have been taught the same thing. My grandchildren have been taught the same thing. Why can't we make some changes? We had the president who was telling us that we are going to be a exporter of food items. But what are their plans? You just don't talk something and then you just will forget it like that. What, how are you going to achieve it? We should be able to ask, interrogate our president. How do you want to achieve this thing you said? From my own view, they should make available for each local government at least one billion each. Not cash, but fat input should be given to them instead of cash so that they can have enough equipment to be able to do this farming business. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for calling in. Amaru, to, to return to the point that you raised, uh, and it, we sort of coincided uh, in thought there because I was just going to mention a couple of bright sparks uh, we have seen in this administration uh, as a throwback to the kind of governance one imagines they had in um, uh, Singapore at the time of Lia Kuan Yu, and certainly successors have continued in, in that theme. Um, arguably, we don't have anything remotely resembling that apart from the bright sparks. Uh, perhaps the uh, Minister of the Interior might have been another one who suddenly, before our very eyes, was doing magic, where people could, you know, uh, he cut down, you know, time on on how you get your documentation and all of that, and people from around the world began to call in. Um, uh, might it be, uh, I, I guess it partly is, do we have round, peg in round, round pegs in round holes, uh, people who actually know what they're doing and can do the president's bidding? I think that one of the things that has been um, an albatross for, for governance in Nigeria is that Many government decisions are taken with a political standpoint and political undertone. With the next election cycle around the corner in perspective, as against taking decisions that are necessary at the time. And I think that that's one of the things that the Tinubu administration must not get um, enmeshed in. Decisions must not reflect um, or must not envisage the next election cycle, but must look at what is fit for us at this time, right? And I'll say, I'll say, uh, 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 the last speaker pointed out the challenge with agriculture, and it's it's all us not growing as we should and deploying the right growth. So I'm a lawyer, and I will even tell you that even the legal education curriculum is outdated. And so, so, so with a lot of our academic curriculum, we, we need to look at it again and begin to change certain things. We are not training people who will be fit adequately, emphasis on the word adequately, to compete in the global market. And that has got to be fixed. Now, having round pegs in round holes is should be a given. It shouldn't be something that we should even be thinking about. And we've seen it clearly with the Minister of Works. 
and how he's been able to intentionally query and question certain contractual decisions that were undermining federal government projects. And if you look at the amount of disbursements that have gone to contractors who have failed to meet their end of the stick, you will now realize that it's not just government and government decisions that are affecting us, but also there are also other players who appear to be undermining the progress that we, we, we seek. In, in other words, so, they are continuing business as usual, even though it was the preferred position of the president that it's no more going to be business as usual. Um, uh, we've almost run one out way of you can have business as usual is where you have ministers and active implementers who understand what they are doing. Right. So if I were the Minister of Works, right, I may not be able to question some of the things that are happening because I don't have the technical knowledge to do that. Yes. It's so important that those on, on the helm of affairs actively take time to fill the pulse of the end user, the citizens. And, and, and you're talking of Lee Kuan Yew had unique ways of understanding what the populace was going through and turning that into um, making government policies around their pain points. Even though some of those things were also straight, but at the end of the day, it addressed the pain points decisively. Nigerians, Nigerians want some, some breather. And if they really see an intentional approach to this, they will align. Indeed. Um, the Minister of Interior is not, it's not a super, yes. right? But he did something that had been peddling us for years. But also, I'm, I'm a, I, 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 I play in the startup space, so I understand technology very well. My challenge is, if even when we're doing this, do we have the technological strength to ensure its sustainability? So what's our digital economy looking like? Luckily, we have a minister who is a player in that, who was a private sector player in that space and understands the challenge of the private sector. But if we really do not, do not rely heavily on technology, even things like farming, right, that we still are doing the old school way, will not improve to give us the results we want. Well, we're, we're going to have to leave it here. Uh, Marui, I, 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 I beg your pardon. We've completely run out of time. It's been an ex exciting time you know, uh, leaning on your insights and your knowledge and uh, your analysis as well. Uh, couple that with um, some of the comments we've got from our viewers. Uh, we, still, we see that we still have a lot of work uh, ahead of us, and um, I guess we can only trust on the um, uh, intentions and sincerity of the government to take us to where we need to be. All of this against the backdrop of whether or not Nigerians, uh, Nigeria uh, should be seeking debt forgiveness. I want to thank you very much, Omarui. Uh, uh, for coming on the program this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and have a good day. Indeed, same to you. Our pleasure. Okay, that's our program today. Do please join us tomorrow for a fresh edition. I am Yori Folarin. Bye-bye for now.